Well, praise the Lord. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to welcome you on behalf of Reverend Dr. Beverly D. Frazier and the Morning Star Church in Yonkers, New York. We want to welcome you to the journey to the cross, the arrest. The journey to the cross, the arrest. My scriptures will be taken from the book of St. Mark, chapter 14, verses 43 through 52. The Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 14, verses 43 through 52. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young man laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. So far, the scriptures. Let us pray. Our heavenly and holy Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we have access to your holy written word. We ask and pray that you would bless this simple witness. Charge it with your power, anointing, and presence. I ask and pray that you would touch, anoint, and illumine this young but brutish mind, that I'll be, hate, be faithful to the written word of God, that the name of Jesus would be exalted and glorified, your people edified, comforted, and exhorted, and an alarm sounded for sinners, as well as the saints we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the living one, who is Lord over all, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Journey to the cross, the arrest. In the Gospel of St. Mark, for those who may not know, Mark was not one of the original 12 apostles or disciples. Mark, who was also known in the scriptures as John Mark, he gets the account of the gospel through one of his mentors, Simon Peter. Simon Peter later on was one of his mentors. We also know that his mother, whose name was Mary, had a house in Jerusalem where many of the disciples of Jesus Christ, after his death, burial, and resurrection, many times the Christians assembled 
in this house of Mary. Another interesting thing that I, I, um, I found out about John Mark, his uncle was a prominent leader in the early church by the name of Joseph, who was also known as Barnabas, the son of consolation. Barnabas was a Levite. And so it's it may be safe to say, Mary being Barnabas' sister and Mark, Barnabas' nephew, they were Levites. And because of this, Mark had a good Christian heritage, a good Christian background. And he takes the account from Simon Peter, according to church history. And he takes the account starting at verse 43. This is taking place in the Garden of Gethsemane where the three disciples fall asleep. They try to stay up with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he's praying to God the Father. The disciples, according to Jesus, in another gospel, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And they couldn't stay up with Jesus to pray at least one hour with him. Jesus is praying, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. Because at this point in time, Jesus was not only going to face being persecuted by the Gentiles, but he was also going to experience something that he had never experienced before becoming sin for the sins of the hu of humanity. This was also where he was also going to experience a, a deeper level of separation from God the Father. And because of this, he's praying. And while he's praying, he says in one verse before verse 43, verse 42, in spite of the pressure being in the garden of Gethsemane, he says, rise up and let us go. I love it about Jesus. In spite of the pressure to being, being able to take on the sins of humanity, to become sin for us and to become separated from God the Father on a, on a level he hasn't experienced before, he says, rise up. I'm ready to go. Drops of blood falling from my head, but I'm ready to go. Ready to face what lies ahead, ahead of him. So not only he is experiencing, he's going to experience separation from God the Father, taking upon himself the sins of humanity. The other thing that he's about to face is betrayal. 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 Now keep in mind, someone once said, betrayal is not done by an enemy. My goodness. It's usually someone, a friend, someone you relied upon, someone you depended upon. It could be a family member. It could be a relative. It could be a neighbor. It could be a friend. And it's one of the deepest wounds in life, betrayal, betrayal, when someone turns on you, turns against you, but yet he's ready to face his betrayer. Who is it? Verse 43, the scripture says, and immediately while he yet spake, cometh Judas. Judas Iscariot one of his 12 disciples, as it says, cometh Judas, one of the 12, one of his students in ministry, one of his learners, 
he comes not by himself, but he comes with a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. So Judas comes against his teacher, his rabbi, his master. He comes with a group of armed people against him. Oh my goodness. Slept, ate, sat, learned from Jesus. And yet he's coming with weapons of violence against his teacher, against his master. And no notice what it says in verse 44. And he that betrayed him. My goodness. So it signifies Judas. Judas. And he that betrayed him had given him a token saying. He came to an agreement because in the garden of Gethsemane, it is nighttime. There are no street lights. So the only source of light is by lamps, lanterns, and torches. So it's dark. So in the midst of the garden, where it's dark, Judas had come to an agreement with, the Bible says, the chief priests, the supervising spiritual leaders in Israel, in Jerusalem, and at the temple. These were the guys that supervised the services, the orders, the worship, the music, the teaching, the sacrifice at Herod's temple in Jerusalem, where Jews from around the world, every able and mobile Jew was to come to offer up their sacrifices unto the Lord for the atonement of their sins. And then you have the scribes, the teachers, and the students of the law, the ones that reproduced the scrolls of the Torah and the Tanakh. And they spent time learning and studying and teaching and transcribing the written word of God. And then you have, and the elders, the seasoned leading men of the communities. And he, Judas came with an agreement saying, this is the one that we need to arrest. The one that I'm going to kiss. That's the one that you need to go after. Because Jesus, Judas rather already came with an agreement to portray Jesus to the Jewish leaders of the day. Verse 45, and as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and said, Master, Master, and he kissed him. My goodness. I want to go over a personal profile of who Judas was. Based upon John 6, 70 and 71, Jesus refers to Judas as a devil for he says Jesus answered them have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil Jesus also referred to Judas almost like a last warning before he betrayed Jesus in Mark 14:21 the Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. My goodness. Jesus, the Savior of the world, pinpoints to his betrayer at the Passover supper and says, whoever's going to betray me, it would have been better for them to have never been born. My goodness. What a eulogy. This is Jesus talking. This is God, not only Judas's master, 
but Judas's creator. And he's saying that over a Passover supper. Then he says in John 17, 12 about Judas, while he was praying to God the Father, while I was with them, John 17, 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name that those that thou gavest me, I have kept and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus talking to God the Father in his prayer, he's saying, I've kept all of my disciples except one. And he's referring here to Judas, calling him the son of perdition, destined to be doomed. Why? So that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Mark 14, 10 says, and Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. So, so Judas betrayed Jesus. And notice what happened. While Judas was leading Jesus' enemies to Jesus and his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, notice what Jesus was doing. Something that was not illegal to do. He was praying. He wasn't breaking Rome's laws. He wasn't breaking any of Israel's laws. He was just praying. He wasn't disturbing the peace. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane just praying. And they come against Jesus almost getting ready to war against him. And Jesus responds as they were in verse 46, and they laid his hands on him and took him. As Judas Iscariot comes with the chief priests, scribes, and elders, notice what he does. Fake affection. Fake public affection. The affection for Jesus was not real. The kiss was to set him up for a downfall. His public affection was a setup for a setback. False sincerity. Master, master. It reminds me of the passage of scripture from Isaiah 29, 13. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart was far from me. So Judas was one of fake love, fake loyalty. So have you ever been betrayed? Have you ever been betrayed by fake love, fake affection, lip service? My goodness. Looks good in public, but phony. It's to set you up or to set you back. And notice, Judas was able to do this because by this time, according to John 44, Luke 22, 3, and John 13, 26, the devil is now dwelling within Judas. My goodness. The father of all liars. My goodness. So Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to get false honor, false love, my goodness, fake affection, my goodness, superficial love, my goodness, lying love, my goodness. And notice what happens. Jesus knows what it's like to be falsely accused, innocent, 
didn't do no wrong, but f arrested anyway. My goodness. Weapons drawn, no charges mentioned, innocent, but getting arrested. Declared guilty, but innocent. My goodness. And notice what happens. The disciple of Jesus, verse 47, and one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Peter cut off a servant or slave of the high priest's ear. My goodness, Peter, Peter, Peter. St. John's gospel identifies Peter to be the one that did this. And notice, Peter could have started a riot in the garden. So Peter could have been arrested or killed if Jesus did not intervene. And this type of crowd was so wicked because that they would use the word of God against Jesus and his disciple because Peter cut off the high priest servant's ear. They could have said from Exodus 21, 24 through 25, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, an ear for an ear, a wound for a wound. So they could have pr promoted injury to Peter or to one of the disciples. And this was a type of crowd that would use the law or try to use the law against Jesus and his disciples, but won't use it to apply it from themselves. My goodness, my goodness. Thanks to Peter. And notice also something. In our, all the four gospels, Jesus never gave the order for Peter to cut anybody. This was on Peter's own volition, on his own impulse. But I'm here to let you know that Jesus, though it looked like he was in trouble, Jesus was not outnumbered. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 52 through 53, it says, Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? That's about more than 72,000 angels. And angels are greater than men. Angels are more powerful than men. So if Jesus wanted to, he could have called to his father and 72,000 angels would have been released to guard and defend Jesus. But then he says later on, how then could the scriptures be fulfilled? Also, so Jesus wasn't outnumbered. And here's something else. John 18, verses 3 through 6. It reads, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, come thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. So notice, as, the, as Judas and the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes and the elders came into the garden of Gethsemane looking to arrest Jesus. 
Jesus wasn't hiding. Jesus wasn't cowering. He went to face them head on. And then he asked them, who are you looking for? My goodness. And notice what they said. They didn't say Jesus the Christ. They didn't say Jesus the Son of God. They didn't say Jesus the Son of David. They didn't say Jesus the Master. They just regarded him as an ordinary man with an address from the ghetto. We're just looking for Jesus of Nazareth. But then Jesus reveals to them, whether they realize it or not, I'm more than just Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he, my goodness. And the Bible says, when he said, I am he, my goodness, they fell backwards and fell to the ground because Jesus was revealing, I am. Just like he revealed himself to Moses in Exodus chapter three, I am that I am, my goodness. So he was revealing to them, even in the garden, to those seen and unseen, I am that I am. I am the great I am. You see me as an ordinary man, but I'm God incarnate in the flesh. And when he, not when he confessed who he was, something repelled them back and shook the ground that they were on. So notice, Jesus wasn't outnumbered and he wasn't weak. Some scholars suggest that all he had to say, if this was not the will of the Father, he could have called his Father and released 72,000 angels. And then he could have just repetitiously kept on saying over and over, I am, I am, I am, all the way out of the garden until he escaped. But because that was not the will of the Father, he stayed. So he was even in control of his arrest. So Jesus understands being lied upon, conspired against, being arrested, mistreated. He also knows what it is like from those in law enforcement for weapons to be drawn even though you're innocent. My goodness. Ready to maim ready to hurt, ready to wound, ready to kill without unjust causes and unjust reasons. Notice he broke no crimes. So this also lets us know, even in this Lenten season, Jesus can identify with police brutality. My goodness. Rights denied, my goodness. And Jesus says to them in verse 49, I was daily with you in the temple, teaching, my goodness, not stirring up, a, not stirring up violence against law enforcement, not stirring up violence against the religious community, not stirring up violence against Pilate or Caesar. I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. There's something greater going on, whether you understand it or not. All of this is taking place so that the promises of God revealed in the prophets must be fulfilled. Why did they not try to take Jesus while he was in the temple? Mark 14 verses 1 through 2 gives us a clue. It reads, after two days was the feast of the Passover and of the and of unleavened bread and the priests sought how they might take him and put him to death. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar 
of the people. My goodness. So basically what they were saying was, we don't want to take him while he's teaching. We don't want to take him while he's preaching. Because one, at this time of a year, where Jews from all over the world are coming to celebrate the Passover, we don't want to be seen arresting Jesus. So they wanted to do it craftily. They wanted to do it secretly. They didn't want to look bad. And here's the other thing. They didn't want there to be an uproar of the people. So we want to look good before the nations. We want to look good before Rome. We want to look good before Pilate. We want to look good and pious before all the Jews around the world. And we're afraid that a riot may take place because if a riot took place, then Rome might want to rain on their parade during this high time, this high holy time of Passover. Because they knew by the law, every able Jew was supposed to come to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover. And then also, if they were not going to be able to celebrate the holy festivities of Passover, this may also affect them on people coming, buying their money, uh, exchanging their currency, r making money off of their monopolies and racketeerings as people came to the temple. So basically, they did not want Rome to reign on their parade, punish them, and keep them from making money. They did not want their income to be interrupted. My goodness. Because they knew that Passover was one of the festivals where they could make money in Jerusalem and in the temple. John... 319 also lets us know why they wanted to arrest Jesus in the darkness. For the Bible says, and this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. This is the condemnation. Jesus being the light of the world has come, but men like this crowd prefer darkness rather than Jesus, the light, because their deeds were evil. Jesus also talks about that the scriptures must be fulfilled. I'm also reminded by Psalms 41 verse 9. It reads about Judas and the betrayal. Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. This was prophesied concerning Judas many centuries ago. In Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, it reads, and I said unto them, if ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. My goodness. And the Lord said unto me, cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So this was prophesied about Judas's betrayal and his price of betrayal for Jesus was 30 pieces of silver. My goodness. The Bible also says in Zechariah, Chapter 13, verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, 
and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. And because of these passages, these were some of the passages from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew scriptures that Jesus must have been referring to in verse 49. And when this occurred, after he said this, all his disciples left him. My goodness. And he told them during over the Passover supper, he said that all of you are going to leave me. In, four, in Mark 14, verse 27, he said, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. So Jesus has already told them what was going to happen within a few hours. And when he said that the scriptures may be fulfilled, they left. Have you ever been abandoned? Have you ever been left alone? Jesus knows and understands. And then in Mark verse 51 and 52, we come to an interesting passage. It reads, and there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body and the young men laid hold on him and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked and many pastors teachers preachers ministers Christian scholars speculate and wonder who was this guy He's, he's not seen in the movies, in all of the movies based upon the ministry, life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They always leave verse 51 and 52 out. So we wonder, who is this guy? So they speculate. And they speculate that this may have been not one of the 12 disciples, because that's not what is said. So they speculate and wonder, was this Lazarus? We don't know because one, Lazarus seemed to have been financially well off with his sisters, Mary and Martha, and they were able to house Jesus and his disciples in their home. So they may have been financially well off. And because he was dressed with linen and linen which may have been from Egypt was very costly and expensive so a linen garment was very expensive in these days so in order to acquire this unless it was a gift you must have had some money some people speculate was this the rich young ruler that may have been walking with Jesus from afar. One minister speculated that when Jesus declared that he was the I am in the garden, that his glory may have resurrected a, a young man that was buried with a linen garment because some Jews were buried in garments of linen because Jesus himself is going to be buried in garments of linen. So we speculate. He may have just been an anonymous spectator, but some Christian scholars think because this is John Mark or Marcus, writing this gospel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Some even question if this was John Mark writing himself in the gospels. 
as we said at the beginning, because this was a linen garment, priests ministered in linen garments. So this may have been a priest, a Levite that may have been coming or going from the temple, uh, an innocent bystander. We don't know. We're not 100% sure. Bible scholars also suggest this may have been John Mark, where the disciples may have had their Passover supper at Mary, John Mark's mom's house. It's speculation. And Mark may have tried to have warned Jesus and the disciples because Judas knew where to find Jesus because Judas left Jesus and the disciples at the house where they were having the Passover meal. So Judas may have went there first before he went to the garden. And Mark may have went to see what was going on to perhaps tr try to prevent the arrest. But it was the will of God that Jesus be arrested. So again, who was that guy? In Mark 14 verses 51 through 52, we're not sure. But this we know, that Jesus was betrayed. In the Garden of Gethsemane, there was cutting, mutilation done by one of the followers, the disciples of Jesus. My goodness. And yet, there was confusion there was chaos almost in the garden, nakedness, shame, embarrassment, all taking place in the garden around Jesus. Not only that, there was humiliation, abandonment, confusion, darkness, fear, stumbling, and panic. Notice, sounds like what's going on in the world today. But in spite of all of that, Jesus is still in control. My goodness. If you've been betrayed, he's in control and he knows. If you've been cut, maybe not just by a physical knife, maybe by the actions of others or by somebody's words, Jesus knows and understands. My goodness. Maybe you were covered and someone exposed you, exposed you with shame, embarrassment, and humiliation. Jesus is about to go through that for you and for me. Maybe you felt abandoned, all alone. Jesus is here to help you with your issues. If you're confused in the dark, if you're fearful, stumbling, and if you feel like panicking, come to Jesus. He has the answer for your problems. Now, I know that we sometimes, during this time of the year, we like to get on the disciples. Yes, they didn't understand. They couldn't understand everything at this time. Even though Jesus spoke with them, spent time with them, taught them, they didn't know what to do. What would have you would have done? Or rather, what would you have done in the Garden of Gethsemane? This is what I love about Jesus. God takes note of our guilt, shame, humiliation, dark times dark days, confusion, chaos and embarrassment, exposed, but he's still in charge and he's still in control. And he's going through all of this for you and for me to redeem us from sin, death, the grave and hell. He was arrested 
because he was the lamb to be picked, to be slain. He was the lamb of God, picked, handpicked by God to take away the sins of the world. And notice, because he is the lamb of God, the hands of wicked sinners had to lay their hands upon the lamb. And sometimes even disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus can hurt, betray, deny, and abandon you. I'm here to let you know, come to Jesus anyway. Let Jesus heal you from the hurt, from the harm, and the abuse, especially if, if it was a follower of Jesus. Let Jesus heal you. Like in Luke chapter 22, verses 50 and 51, when Simon Peter cut off Malchus's ear, the high priest's servant, he said to the crowd, permit me to do this. And he touched Malchus' ear and healed him. If you need healing from the past, if you need healing for your present circumstances, come to Jesus, call upon his name, pray and ask him. What have you to say about Jesus? Is he a liar? a lunatic or Lord. His words must come to pass. The scriptures, as Jesus said, must be fulfilled. If they didn't, and if they didn't forsake him like he said they would, if, he, if they didn't betray him and deny him like Jesus said they would, Jesus Christ would have been wrong and he cannot be wrong or he wouldn't be the Christ and God. And because of that, he would not would have been able to atone for the sins of humanity. The Bible says in Mark 14 verse 21, the son of man indeed goeth as it is written of him but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. Jesus has come to save us. Jesus has come to save even you. To reject the gift of salvation offered to us through the gospel you intend to wind up where Judas went or to experience his fate. If you do not receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it would have been better if you had never been born. For a person that is not born again, you will wish you were never had been born. And so we offer you this opportunity. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the living one, who is Lord of all, has come to save you. What you need now to do is to repent. Change your mind and call upon his name. Why don't you do it right now where you are? Repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I declare that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer 
and sincerely meant it from your heart, I want to welcome you into the family of God. And Father, even right now, I pray for everyone who has called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. I ask and pray, Holy Spirit, right now that you would meet them where they are and that the Holy Spirit would come upon them and that the power of the Holy Ghost would overshadow them. And I ask and pray that you would deliver them and set them free and make them free in and through the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we declare that every chain in their life is broken. Every fetters of iron shattered in their life. Every yoke, every root, seed, and fruit of bondage is destroyed in the mighty name of Jesus. We decree that every desire, that their heart and appetites are now submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the written word of God and the principles of the kingdom of God. I ask and pray even right now that you would heal them that you would deliver them in the mighty name of Jesus from every hurt, from every wound, from every type and form of abuse in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, that you would take control of their life from this day forward. Lord, deliver them from guilt. Deliver them from shame. Deliver them from pain. Deliver them from humiliation. Deliver them from confusion. Deliver them from darkness into your marvelous light, Lord God. And if they have experienced shame and humiliation, embarrassment, lift up their head, Lord God. And Lord, heal and deliver them from every type and form of abandonment. Heal and deliver them from even betrayal, even people who meant well but could not live up to their commitment. Lord, do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we're able to ask or think of thee. And I ask and pray that you would open doors for them to be baptized in water because of the remission of sins. And that, Lord, that you would fill them with the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And on behalf of our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Beverly D. Frazier and the Morning Star Church family in Yonkers, New York, we want to thank you for participating on today's lesson on the journey to the cross, the arrest. May the Lord your God bless you richly in his name. Amen.